right? That's right. He's my dad. I'm Julie Mangin. We're taping this on February 15th, 2002. It's about 9.45 in the morning. And the only other person present is um, Pauline B. Mangin, who's walking around but not participating in this interview. And, okay, would you tell me, to start off, what branch of the service you were in and the rank and where you served? Uh, I uh, was in the Army Air Corps. And uh, I uh, had a rank that when I left the, uh, the service of uh, first lieutenant and navigator. Mm -hmm. And I served in the European Theater of Operations in the 448th Bomb Group, uh, which was stationed at Seething in uh, England. Mm -hmm. And we uh, carried out 35 missions against the uh, Northern Europe, uh, German, and, and uh, Italian, and all those uh, defenses. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how old were you when you uh, heard about Pearl Harbor, and what were you doing when that happened? Uh, I was uh, uh, 18 years old, uh, just short of my 19th birthday, about it, it, when Pearl Harbor occurred, uh, I was uh, about nine months away from 19. Mm -hmm. uh, when I enlisted, I was about, uh, I guess, only two weeks away from being 19. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I finished the uh, second of my, uh, yeah, the, the, the second semester at Purdue, and then. Uh, I was not called up immediately after I enlisted, and I had time to finish the third semester. And finally, my uh, well, my enlist my enlistment was the fifteenth uh, day of September in 1941. Uh, the no, in 1942, rather. Um, my uh, my time of going to uh, uh, over to uh, the service from the civilian to the service life what started uh, uh, on the 26th of January 1943. Now what were you doing at Purdue? Were you uh, studying? Uh, uh, studying uh, to be a mechanical engineer. Mechanical? Okay. So that interrupted that and uh, were you, back then did they have eligibility to be deferred from the draft if you were in school? Oh yes, they, they had that. Uh, and why didn't you well, pursue first, that? Well, first of all, I, I was not uh, far enough advanced in my schooling to uh, make it certain that I would uh, get uh, a, you know, a deferment to finish. Mm -hmm. So I just decided that it would be better if I enlisted because I wanted to make sure that I didn't miss getting uh, into the Air Force and being, uh, uh, getting hopefully uh, being a pilot. Mm -hmm. That's what you wanted, huh? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So where were you living when uh, the war broke out? I was living in a, in a rooming house in uh, Purdue. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, four or five uh, other students that were running, running rooms in this house. And uh, at the time that we first heard about it, I was over at a, a similar house uh, uh, doing uh, math exercises with a, with a friend. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, after the radio announced that we were had been, that Pearl Harbor had been bombed, we, we knew that there was no sense in studying the rest of the, <laughs> the rest of the day. But not. <laughs> so, so what was it like when you first got inducted after, um, I guess you said late January of uh, 42? 43. 43. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the uh, service was, to me, of course, uh, immense. And that was the, the first uh, uh, impression I got of it because you, you weren't at all around five or six people as you usually are in civilian life, but there were 3,000 mm -hmm. at that time. 
Yeah. You were from a small town, yeah. so it was different, right? Yeah, and uh, so when we uh, when we got to uh, uh, Fort Thomas, Kentucky, where I was inducted, uh, it, it was not just myself and a few other people. It was hundreds, mm. and uh, uh, you, they, it was this immense business of long lines waiting to you get your service, <laughs> mm. you know, and. Uh, so that, that was a, one of the, the first things that I had to overcome. And I, now I'm in a, in a great group, you know. And we got on a, on a troop train, and they sent us to uh, Shepherd Field, Texas. And it uh, uh, was the same impression. You, you, you were not just in one car. There, was, there were servicemen in 20 cars. Mm. <laughs> and uh, went, so everything had to be... Uh, everything had to be checked in and checked out and in, in an immense quantity and mm -hmm. we spent an awful lot of time just standing there in neutral until everybody was ready to, as they used to say, pop to and, yeah. and uh, march off, you know. Now, at what point when you were with this huge group of people did you start realizing, okay, this is a small group of people that I'm going to be sticking with. Was it training, or was it when you were assigned to your crew, or when did you like start making friends that you stuck with? Well, the, the only I, I made, always made friends uh, in every barracks that I went into. There, there was certain people that uh, thought like I did uh, of the, the my manner is more or less uh, uh, low key, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, in, a, in a barracks of Forty or forty or so. Uh, there's always a loud mouth, and then there's a comic, and uh, there's uh, people who are disgruntled, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I just hung out with the medium crowd. I I didn't make a lot of waves, and and uh, I felt that uh, that was the best way to live. Yeah. So uh, of course I laughed at a lot of it because we used to have a. a in one of our barracks at Shepherd Field, we used to have the inveterate uh, dice throwers, and, oh. and we had a we had a boy there that was uh, he had a, a slight lisp in his talking, and uh, every time that he was getting ready to throw the dice, he would say "shoot twee, <laughs> shoot twee," and they would they would play all day, and they even get out on the uh, the uh, little step out in front of the second floor. We were on the second floor, and a little, a little balcony out on the, on the second floor, and there was light up there at the top. And they, so they put, put a blanket on, on the boards so the dice wouldn't go through the cracks. And they kept on playing dice until one, one guy had it all, and, and the rest of them had none. Oh, dear. So, but even at 2 o'clock in the morning, you could hear him saying, Hear this guy saying, "Shoot, twee, shoot!" <laughs> he always wanted to shoot three dollars. That was his mm -hmm. his idea of what'd be lucky. Well, I since guess. you didn't gamble, what did you do to entertain yourself? I read. You read? Yes. Do you I, remember I, any I, of the I, things you read? Well, I read mostly novels and and uh, some history, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, I uh, I was like everybody else. I wasn't, uh, you know. I, I sort of had nervousness of getting getting something done let's get somewhere you know right and uh, and that that training at Shepherd Field was of course basic training just exactly like the army uh, takes but everybody knowing that they were going to go into aviation mm -hmm. uh, didn't take it too seriously right because you knew you're destined yeah. a little better than your that's right so so mm -hmm. we were we knew we weren't going to be living in trenches and things like that, but uh, it was uh, so. So a lot of it was just sort of, and they scaled it down a little bit for us. Mm -hmm. But we did have to take the standard 15 mile hike, mm -hmm. and uh, that was something to remember. <laughs> so how long after you finished? You had basic training for how many weeks, and then you went into the aviation school? Well, uh, they we had the eight weeks basic basic training. And uh, uh, the Air Force had so many enlistees, they didn't know what to do with them. And uh, the uh, flight schools were all filled. And, th and they had 
people standing in line that would fill up all the flight schools again. Really? So it was a dilemma on her part, but it was also an opportunity to fill a need. And that is uh, to take some of these people and take us, they just took us all back to college. Now, even though I had three years uh, uh, in engineering, uh, they sent me and all my compatriots uh, from Shepherd Field and from someplace else to Oklahoma Baptist University in Shawnee, Oklahoma. Hmm. It was a liberal arts college, and they they had 500 of us there in a, in a corps, which they, they uh, the, the college turned over one of their dormitories. Uh, at, at, I think it held about 200, and then we had the rest of them out on separate uh, buildings, you know, that weren't, weren't actually a, an established dormitory. It was just a, a vacant place you could stick somebody. But uh, we, uh, we only stayed there, uh, I think, uh, four months. Hmm. And uh, it, was, it was interesting. I, I was, to, just to show you the, the diversity, I was in a, in a room with a guy who was uh, an ex-truck driver. And uh, another guy was, uh, uh, had been a haberdasher. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and of course, I had been, the only one who had been to college of the three of us. And uh, so I was trying to teach them a simple arithmetic, and, and it, was, it was really eighth grade arithmetic. Mm -hmm. And they were having troubles with it. Oh, dear. So you can see the, the ki ki kinds of mentalities. And then, of course, uh, in the same group of 500, there were some very, very good uh, uh, experienced and intelligent uh, fellows that had gone to uh, military school, uh, uh, private, you know, uh, for, uh, for their high school. And, and some even for the college. And of course, they, they became the officers of that corps because mm -hmm. they were the only one that, that even had any concept of, of what uh, a military formation is and how you move one and uh, how you call it uh, tension and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And, and so, uh, the one guy we had, I can't think of his name, but I think it was something like Callahan, but he had a tremendous voice. He, you could hear him for three blocks, and uh, he made an ideal uh, corps commander. I don't know, it's just lucky they had him, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, and he shaped up the rest of the lieutenants that he had to have to uh, march the formations in an orderly way. But uh, that, that was a good uh, experience. Uh, mm -hmm. it, uh, I enjoyed it because it was it was not hard work. <laughs> well, eventually you had to get into the serious um, flight well, training school. Yes, well, we uh, <clears throat> we uh, went through uh, this Army training, and we had been through it at, at Fort uh, uh, Shepherd Field. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was in Amarillo, Texas. And it was hot and dry and they, they had a, uh, a story going around the base that, that the, the wind blows all of Oklahoma down to Texas in the morning and in the afternoon it blows it back up to Oklahoma because it was very dusty. Oh, <laughs> and uh, very little rain in, the, in that particular on that, in that particular year. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, that was the that was the introduction to getting into the into the Air Force and, and uh, we had never seen an airplane yet. Right. So then we went to, uh, we went to, we were, we were all divided up into different schools and, and the one that I was sent to with probably 30 or 40 others uh, was uh, at Coleman Field uh, in, uh, 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 no, it wasn't, it was, I can't remember the name of the field, but it was in Coleman, Texas. And uh, that, that, of course, was a, uh, a little better than uh, Shepherd Field. It was about uh, 50 or 60 miles south of where Shepherd Field was. And uh, there were other better bases that you could have gone to. 
uh, than, than Coleman. Coleman was, uh, it, was, it had just been uh, a civilian base that had been converted into to making it uh, take, take care of. Of course, this was only primary training. We only used, we was flying the Fairchild uh, PT-21, I think. It, uh, mm -hmm. There's a number of it, a low wing uh, monoplane. That's what you trained on? And that's that's the first plane you trained on. Mm -hmm. and of course, I didn't train very long because uh, uh, in, uh, I think, about the second half, the beginning of the second half of the nine weeks, it all was a nine week course, uh, they washed me out. And why was that? Because uh, I had. Uh, an awful lot of trouble landing the plane uh, with a, a uh, three-point landing. Oh. See, now I could land it with the with the two wheels, at, but it wasn't satisfactory to my instructor. Mm. He says you don't you don't really have control of the plane. Well, a lot of airplanes are landed on two wheels, and then then they set the tail down, or either that. The, most of the a lot of the planes are. Uh, with a front nose wheel, and you don't you don't have to, you know, you don't have to uh, in your first six or eight weeks uh, be able to contact, uh, make this perfect uh, three point landing. But this instructor insisted. That was his standard. And instead of instead of having instead of having me go up and some, learn some of the maneuvers that the, that the uh, the man who came in from the Air Force at the end of nine weeks to give you a test on what you had learned, instead of well, okay, we'll every day we'll land a few times and and, and you just try to do it better each time, and then and he'd take you up and do the maneuvers. Well, uh, as it turned out, um, uh, we wasted so damn much time trying to get a, get a three point landing, and uh, there wasn't any time left to teach me. Uh, how to put a plane in the spin and bring it out, mm -hmm. and so I was just I was just learning that particular feature <coughs> when all of a sudden I said, they said "Well, we're going to uh, give everybody a, a, a test by an Air Force pilot who came in from somewhere else in the system." And uh, when when it came to me, they gave me the washout. Oh, and. Uh, so and I was pretty, pretty convinced. One time when we were, we were uh, see, we were flying a plane that didn't have an electronic uh, uh, communication system between the the, the uh, fellow and the, the instructor in the back of you. It was a Gosport with uh, where the sound was carried through a uh, an air tube oh. connecting your. And, and this guy was, uh, you know, he was a anything but uh, nice. Mm. He, he had a short fuse, they said. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, I, I, you know, tried as I may, I couldn't please him. Mm -hmm. And one time that I remember in particular that what, what made him put me on the, on the list was we we got the plane into a, into a stall, and then he says to me. He told me when we were on the ground what he said, but he had yen like that, you know, and that's the way it sounded. And uh, uh, what he was saying was, "It's your plane, see," and so uh, it, and so I took took it out of the stall, and then. Uh, he signaled to me, you know, to, uh, to do the, uh, put it into a spin. And uh, so I got it into a spin, and then he, during the spin, he said something too that I couldn't understand. And so I let it come down too close for his liking <laughs> before we straightened it out. Yeah. And so then we flew back to base, and he just jumped all over me. And you certainly six or eight inches from the guy, you can hear everything he says. But up there in the airplane, you can't, uh, particularly when, when he's here. Uh, 
uh, talking through you through an air tube. Mm -hmm. It would be different if it was uh, electronic and, mm -hmm. and things like that. But anyway, that's what that's why I washed out. I I I just screwed up and and uh, almost killed him according to him. Ah, but uh, there's two sides to every story. Yeah, but. Uh, so how was navigation, though? Did you well, go with, with well, a different group of people? Well, when I, when I first of all, I, I, I'll tell you when I went in to uh, talk to uh, uh, the uh, uh, commanding officer of the base, and he was giving me the, the story about, okay, you're washed out, now uh, what would you like to go to? And uh, so he said, how about being a navigator? And he and I said I don't want to be a navigator. And he said, Now wait a minute, wait until you get all of, all of the uh, the, the uh, all of the choices, because they're looking for people to send to the Fifth Army uh, tank uh, operation in in uh, on Fort Knox, Kentucky, or someplace in that in that neighborhood. And uh, so right away I saw the the uh, silliness of <laughs> accepting that. So I said, okay, I'll be a navigator. And they sent me down to to uh, Ellington Field uh, in Texas. I stayed there about two weeks and I was sent up to um, San Marcos uh, Navigation School. And uh, so uh, unfortunately, even in that, it wasn't so simple because I didn't graduate with my the class I started with because of my mother's uh, illness, and eventually uh, I was even dropped out of the second class I was put in. I, I they they sent me back home because she was just about ready to die, and uh, so I saw her for the last time, and then I came back down to Texas again, and I was I, was, I started out in in what the class 44. A, which meant that he would graduate in the first month of 1944, and uh, so uh, then I I came back uh, to uh, to the base and got started after I'd had my uh, leave to go see my mother, which the Red Cross uh, in the hometown always uh, sent the service. A notice that somebody has a relative, uh, oh. a close relative, is about to die, and if there's no uh, urgent reason, they, they should allow them to come home, and they they, they did that. But uh, at I got started with uh, class 44B, and uh, uh, about uh, three quarters of the way through it, my mother actually died, hmm. and so then the they appeal that I be uh, allowed to go home to, to, to the funeral. So I did that, and then I wound up with class 44C. <laughs> so, uh, but the, the navigation went went well. I got I got through that, and uh, was graduated, and then I was sent to uh, Shepherd F or no uh, Biggs Field in. Uh, El Paso, Texas, where I first met my my army crew, uh, and uh, they were all a likable bunch, and uh, we we hit it off real well. So, how long did you stay together with them before you were ready to? Well, go to Europe? we 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 stayed there about uh, around six weeks, and then uh, in. Uh, in late May of uh, 1944, we started overseas, mm -hmm. and uh, we, we went to Topeka, Kansas, to on a train to pick up an airplane, and we flew it across to uh, to Scotland. How did you feel flying across the ocean for the very first time? Well, it was like everything else. <laughs> it was just, you know, you had to know, you had to. Uh, had to do it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, wow, that's that must have been very exciting. Oh, uh, it was. It was an exciting time, and uh, and uh, we 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 spent a lot of time in uh, in uh, Labrador and uh, and up in uh, Greenland, where 
where we landed a, a field called Bluey West One, which is a a, a, a field that was uh, used for the Air Force to make make the uh, break the trip up into shorter hops, see, because we, we didn't have the tanks to get across to all the way across to Scotland. Mm -hmm. And so then uh, at, when we, we stayed there about three or four days because the weather was so bad, even though it was June, and that was the day that, uh, that in June of uh, 1944 when uh, the uh, D-Day began. Mm -hmm. And we got to uh, we got the news, you know, from the, the radio, of course, and uh, we, we knew then that we were on our way to war because that that was the big thing that the troops were were being collected in in uh, mm -hmm. uh, England. So uh, we 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 left and. Uh, we were still, when we got to England, we had to be trained again because, well, there's, there's things about uh, flying operations in, in a wartime group that are not the same as, as flying in training. And so we were getting closer and closer to the, the ultimate uh, flying job. And so when we, uh, when we started, we, uh, well, all the, my pilot, my pilot was Harold Piper, and uh, the co-pilot was uh, Edwin Beckman, and uh, the uh, rest of the, the uh, eight members of the crew were the bombardier, navigator, and uh, six gunners. Uh, most of the gunners had. Uh, two jobs. Uh, there's an engineer that handled one of the guns and a radio operator handled another gun. And then there were uh, five, four others that uh, made up the rest of the crew. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was a, a, a good plane to fly in. I, I, I think the B-24 uh, was, was one of the best to be assigned to, and of course, if you assigned to one that was always lucky, why it's not so bad. <laughs> so, you, did you have the same plane for all the missions? Oh no, no, you, you just flew whatever. Whatever uh, was available. But uh, yeah, and well, a lot of them. See, we we had, we we had one of them that uh, uh, was called a gung ho, and this this was the the, uh, the group commander had flown some in in. Uh, uh, the Asian uh, before the war, and and uh, he liked that uh, Asian uh, phrase "gung ho," mm -hmm. so he named one the "gung ho," and so they painted "gung ho" "gung ho" on it, and and uh, the uh, you still got time. Yeah, the uh, thing about it was they were it was evidently uh, a very unlucky name because. <laughs> I was never in one of them, but three of them got shot down <laughs> out of four. Mm -hmm. And he said, we don't name any more of them gung-ho. <laughs> oh, you mean they kept naming them gung-ho and then yeah, something would name happen? An, name, name another one, see, <laughs> gung-ho. But uh, we, we flew one that I liked real well because it had the best equipment and it. it was called Umbriago. What does that mean? I'm not I'm not very sure, except it, it, I think it means something like friend or something like that. I'm oh, not we'll sure. I'll have to look that up. Is it an Italian word, do you think? I think it was. But anyway, they, we flew it for three or four missions, and then it got shot down. And so then we went to... But somebody else was in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank goodness for that. And you know, the the, the, the uh, Pied Piper is what we call the, the plane we flew across the ocean. And uh, uh, it was... Uh, uh, taken away from us when we got over in Scotland and put into a depot where it was equipped for uh, flying in, in uh, the European theater. And so we never got to fly the plane we had paid for to have the, uh, the, uh, oh. the, the sign painted on it. 
We never, we didn't even know it, didn't hear about it. And and of course my uh, my bombardier uh, uh, kept a diary and, and and read the newsletters and everything of of, uh, of the Air Force. And uh, he found out that uh, the Pied Piper got shot down on its 16th mission. Oh dear. So if it was if it was uh, destined for that, I'm glad we didn't we didn't get, we didn't get to keep it. <laughs> okay. Uh, you could do up to 35 mission, combat missions, and then they would let you go if you wanted to. And you did all 35, right? Yes. Right. So, I don't know if you want to talk about all of them, but you want to talk about some of the most notable? Yes, well, uh, the ones that, that uh, I remember more than anything else was um, the, uh, the time we went to Kiel. Mm -hmm. uh, it was... Uh, they, Kiel, Germany. Yeah, they they had a, a submarine base up there, a submarine uh, manufacturing, and uh, also they had uh, armament, uh, an armament uh, uh, manufacturing going on just in the same area, and uh, so uh, the uh, weather in in northern Europe was uh, not always. Uh, the best, uh, of course, the best is when you can see the ground because the bombardiers did a better job, and uh, so they picked out uh, two targets that uh, they wanted to to knock out. One was at the, the, the sub base at uh, Kiel, and the other was uh, the uh, oil storage facilities at. Uh, the uh, town of Ham, Ham or Bremen, Bremen, and uh, so uh, we uh, got a code word for each one of them. And when we started across the uh, peninsula there, north of Kiel, and start and began to turn down toward Kiel uh, in, in its direction, but we were about five or six miles easter easter uh, of Kiel and. Uh, uh, there was a period of time in there where we were supposed to get the code words of where we were going. And uh, they picked out uh, the code name Tin Pants if we were going to, to Kiel and uh, Blue Boy if we were going to Bremen. And we, leading the division, uh, heard that they gave the, the code word tin pants. And we turned off just one division the, the, of, the, of the whole group that we had amassed, and it was between 500 and 700 planes. And uh, so uh, we, uh, we made the turn with uh, three uh, bomb groups, which each about 50, so about 150 planes went over Kiel instead of uh, five or six hundred. Well, it uh, made a real fiasco out of it. Uh, the the uh, of the 150 planes, uh, about 16 or 18 of them were, were shot down completely, and, and a lot of them were. Uh, shot up so bad that they uh, headed up to the Malmo Airdrome in Sweden, and uh, uh, of course they would be interned for the rest of the war. And why was that? Well, because the, once you landed on a neutral base, they couldn't let they couldn't let you out. That was neutrality. Oh. So you, they just kept you. So uh, uh, we, in our plane. Uh, lost an engine, and the uh, conversation between the pilot and the co-pilot was uh, such that the co-pilot misunderstood and, and feathered a second engine that was was uh, really working. Mm. What do you mean feathered? Well, that they feather the prop. As soon as the engine goes bad, they feather the prop, and then the prop won't spin. 
Oh. And, see, and it makes a, a lot less drag. Oh. So, so we got one engine out because it's leaking oil, and and it had to be shut off. And we got the southern week shut off by mistake. And there were how many in all? Four. Four engines. Four yeah. engines. So anyway, we were so we, we we turned out of the out of the crowd going back to England uh, of whatever was left of the 500 planes that, that went over there in the first place. It was whatever it was. I, I can't really uh, account for how many planes actually made the turn, mm -hmm. but we were we were leading the group that made the turn. Now, but just for clarification, when you said that the plane landed in Sweden, no, well, it, yeah, when, if a plane landed in Sweden, was it just the plane that had to stay there for the no, duration, the, or the, the troops the, too? The troops too, yeah. Oh, so you would have had to stay in Sweden for all that time? Yeah. Oh. And so anyway, we 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 turned out to, to uh, uh, out of the out of the formation, and and the pipe and Piper, our pilot, notified a guy behind him that you know that he was going going to leave. And of course, it wasn't wasn't hard to tell. And uh, so uh, uh, we got started towards Sweden. I gave him a heading, and then he started talking to his co-pilot and finds out that, that uh, he, he feathered two, two uh, engines and one of them was feathered accidentally. They got that worked out to turn it back on again and it came back on everything was fine and he had all well, three quarters of full power. Mm -hmm. So he uh, asked him, give me a heading back to, to the base. And so I gave him a heading back to the base and and uh, I remember that we got, we got some more flat coming up, and it turns out there's an island called Heligoland, which was a uh, a, a German uh, uh, test and scientific uh, rocketry. Uh, you know, it, it was a secret uh, installation. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, that's the way. That's what I used for my check, my uh, my takeoff point to get back home, because <laughs> we were close enough to it. And of course, he he skirted it, but I knew that I was at Heligoland. and it gave me the correct time or a uh, correct position. And they were throwing up flak at. I don't care. At, 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 uh, so uh, we we were uh, uh, we were you know we averted it by going, flying around it, but I had the right time and I had the right position that helped helped me get because because by this time the sky was overcast mm -hmm. and, uh, and when you got out over the water it was overcast. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, of course you you've got radio and that you home in on and things like that. But uh, you still try to navigate from a known point. Yeah. So uh, then we uh, we got back without any any happenings. Mm -hmm. uh, the one engine that, that uh, running bad it, it picked up a piece of flak, mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, it was. Were you in? You know, how did you feel? I mean, weren't you a Kind of nervous, how, you know. How'd you keep your head cool to navigate <laughs> with all well, this going on? Well, uh, <laughs> you wanted to live. <laughs> that's, uh, the, the desire to do a good job, and mm -hmm. and after all, you do feel a responsibility for the rest of the people on the plane. Yeah, and, absolutely. And so uh, it was. It was. I, I was not a, a hero of any way, any kind, because. There wasn't anything heroic about it, but it was doing your job. Well, did you feel yourself um, maintaining a certain sense of cool when you were on a, all your missions, and did you have some way of helping yourself get into a state where you'd be able to do your job under pressure? Yes. Uh, uh, well, one of the things that, uh, fortunately, uh, other than Keel, it was the only one where we had any bad damage. That was the only one? Yeah. 
not bad for 35. Yeah, yeah, not long for it. But we, 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 were, we were right in the thick of it, and fortunately, there were a lot of planes went down in the group. Uh, I mean, like, we were about 48 planes that we put up for a mission. And uh, uh, almost every time that we went out, at least three would get shot down, and about four or five of them would have real strict damage. It was, more, it was miraculous that they got back to the base. And uh, we had a number of them where we were in that condition, mm -hmm. where we'd had to, we had to land it. One of the one of the flak uh, uh, cut out all of our hydraulics, and so we had nothing but mechanical brakes to stop the plane on it. And, and when you got a plane that heavy, uh, it's a lot of strength needed. It, it, it's tremendous. And so they had a, a long runway that the RAF had built, about five miles long. And uh, so even if you had bad brakes. Uh, you could stop eventually, wow. and, and uh, it would almost, if you landed at the beginning of it uh, to, and just never did anything, it would stop before you got to the end of it. But did you ever have to do yes, a landing we, like that? We, we, we flew in there twice. Mm. The first time, we were, uh, our, our hydraulic system had been shut out, and so we landed there successfully. And then just leave the plane to be uh, to be repaired, and then we took took back off to uh, to the to the uh, home base in a truck. Now, what did you call that kind of landing? You said you foot flew. What? 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 What was it? What did you use to? Um, what do you call the kind of landing where you didn't have the hydraulics and you had to? Um, well, you you have mechanical brakes, mm -hmm. you know, which uh, which are uh, they're, they're very uh, hard to operate, and they're not as effective mm -hmm. as hydraulic. Right. See, and when you're when you're when you're coming in with a heavy plane, that's that's very important. Yeah. So anyway, we landed. We he landed it, and, and there's one thing that, uh, that you talk about being cool in 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 combat. My pilot was cool. Really. really. He was flying that airplane, and it didn't matter to him where he was flying it. He had his mind on what you do to fly the airplane, and that was... He never looked out the window and see how bad it was out there in the flag. Or, of course, that was my job was to look and to report on. Mm -hmm. But uh, he was uh, totally concentrated, a marvelous guy. And, uh, and I, I admired him all the time I was with him. Mm -hmm. <coughs> how does the Army see, or the yeah, the Army Air Corps? How did they seem to find people with those kind of mental abilities and emotional stability? Is that what it was for, or, or well, or how did you? How do they know? They don't really know. It's it's accidental, really. But of course, there's, there's some of it is is the the uh, in the person who decides that he wants to be an aviator. You know, mm -hmm. they're, they're, that they're not usually timid people. That's true. And uh, they're, uh, of course, if they're big in size, you see, like what bothered my size was that that uh, I was just a little over 130 pounds when I was in the service. Huh. And uh, uh, that's a part of it. He, he was, I was a five foot seven. He was. Uh, six foot two, and uh, uh, he probably weighed 175 pounds. Mm -hmm. And uh, the co-pilot was even larger. He was he was uh, around he was around six foot five, and 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 he weighed well into 200 pounds. Mm -hmm. So he had a lot of strength, and and uh, to fly the B-24 took a lot of strength. Really, it was it really did. It was. Uh, a hard plane to fly. It, it, it flew well, but to keep it in formation and and you know keep it on the on the, the line, pilots had to really use their arms and and it, it just uh, there's comments and 
and, and a lot of books about how hard it was to fly the B-24 for that reason. Hmm. But, uh, but anyway, the other time we went to this, this long runway, um, when they let the bombs go, one of them hung up. Hmm. So we had a 500-pound bomb hanging on one of the brackets. And, and the way the bombs are, are rigged, they got uh, two uh, grips that hold them, and they are released electrically. And the bomb drops, and they're both supposed to release at one time. Mm -hmm. well, we got one, the front one didn't release, and so the bomb was hanging in our bomb bay at an angle like this from the time we got off of the target until we got across the North Sea and uh, into this five mile long runway. And so when they, when they uh, got down on the ground and they were, and they were uh, flying, the, the pilot told the, the, uh, the engineer to get down and see if he could uh, pry that thing loose. So he pried it loose, and it dropped down on the runway, and it was following us. And so the pilot. Oh, you mean as you're landing? Yeah. He landed. See. Oh, you were oh. already on the ground. You're already uh. on the ground. As soon as I touch down, you try to, prop, uh, to pry that thing off. <laughs> so anyway, it dropped to the to the, the nose of it dropped to the concrete. It used to drop about five feet. So, mm -hmm. So Could that have and, it and it wasn't and it wasn't dropping on the uh, on the nose either, wh where the detonator is. Oh, okay. See? I see. So it uh, so it followed us down the runway, and and so when they got clear down to the end of the five miles, uh, we were we were going slow, and it was catching up with us, and so he had to swerve off and out of the way, and and the, and the bomb went. <laughs> Went on down the runway, and then finally it, it too lost uh, lost speed. And of course, as far as we were concerned, it was you know the ground boys' <laughs> job. <laughs> but it didn't de detonate after all that. Oh no, it didn't. See, a bomb won't detonate uh, just from dropping on its side. But it has to hit the nose where it's the detonator. It's got to hit the detonator, see, to, for it to go. And how? I wonder how come it didn't. You'd think it would have run into something, but it didn't. No, well, there was nothing on, on the runway. This, yeah. this big five-mile runway, the only two times I've been on it, it was just completely vacant. There are no buildings around it, nothing. Mm. See? Good thing. It just built out in the, in, the, uh, in the English countryside. Well, actually, the shore. It's right on the, sh right on the shore. And it's very close to that famous White Cliffs of Dover. Wow. Yeah. So... Um Tell us the tell us the story about the clock. Oh, yes. that one I just well, love hearing about. <coughs> well, <coughs> yeah, let me take a drink. Sure. Well, the British Third Army got into supply trouble, and they were in uh, Holland, and uh, it was uh, 1945. It was probably or four months before May 45 when the, when the war was over. And uh, uh, they said, well, we're going we're, we're to use the 8th Air Force to supply uh, uh, by parachute. They, 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 it was sort of like air rail because it was going to get there a heck of a lot quicker than those trucks coming across uh, France and, and uh, into Holland, where the where the uh, British Army was, so uh, we came in to our uh, flight area, and and they loaded all kinds of cases and things like that tied to parachutes, and they had a specialist that had been trained to to do this, and to so he rigged up a a, uh, a rig up in the ceiling of the B-24's uh, Bombay, and he uh, put, well actually what they did, it wasn't in the Bombay, they took the ball gun out, the, the, the ball gun underneath the B-24, leaves a, a circle about, 
about 42 inches in diameter. And through that, these packages would all would, would all fall. Mm -hmm. And they were up on on a track that led over to that, that hole. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the specialist that came up and rigged it and got it all up there, well, he didn't account, I guess, for the fact that uh, the weight would come down on this side a lot more oh. than, than it was designed for. And, and it resulted in him getting knocked out of the airplane with no parachute on. Oh, no. Yeah. That's terrible. I didn't even learn, learn his name. As a matter of fact, I didn't even see him because I was up on up at the up in the nose of the plane. Well, so what didn't you do then? Well, we couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, on our way to this drop zone, uh, we passed by a small town, and we were flying oh, just above treetops, you know, and. Uh, so uh, I noticed up ahead uh, there was a town town clock. The first thing I noticed, and and a tower, and we're flying right for it. And uh, so I uh, said to myself, uh, "Hey, these guys are going to hit that damn thing." <laughs> and uh, so I didn't want to distract the pilot because by calling him up because it, I, I said, I'm sure he's up there looking out of the big plate glass window. He can't miss. That's knowing it. Well, anyway, it turned out <clears throat> that um, for some reason or other, uh, he, the co-pilot kept hitting him on the, on the right arm. To mean that was his signal for go up, up, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and Piper just misread it or uh, reacted slowly or whatever. And we came across, and I was looking out the, the navigator's window, which is up front as a blister window, and you could see uh, up ahead, and and I could see the rooster on top of the of the building, and it was coming right at the number three engine, and or a number two engine on on the right side, the left side, of the, and. Uh, it passed between the uh, propeller. You can see the propeller uh, circle, you know, when, even when the propeller is running. It passed between the, the, the uh, window I was looking out of and that uh, uh, the propeller blade. That's the peak of the uh, steeple. Peak. That, that was the. That was a. And I could I could see the pigeon. Uh, Poop. Manure <laughs> all over the clock. That's how close you were. That's how close it, it, it was. We, I, I think it. I think that there was only about six inches that that, that rooster had to pass through. <laughs> and uh, and I saw him go by, and uh, I just couldn't believe we missed it. <sighs> what did the pilots say afterwards? Oh, they were aware of it. Why weren't they well, aware? They were. The pilot was concerned with something else. Oh. I don't know what it was. And, and Beckman, instead of shouting at him, were putting on his putting his uh, thumb on his uh, throat mic and saying, "Get the hell up!" I mean, anything like that. <laughs> he just <clears throat> he just tapped him on the elbow because oh. that they had a signal that that's what they used. It a mod automatically pill up. Well, Piper told me when we were, we were on the ground. He said. Well, it's just because I knew he was hit, hit me. He said I looked and realized I was high enough. Well, see, he couldn't, he couldn't see everything. Mm -hmm. And 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 I said, well, you sure weren't high enough <laughs> for me. <laughs> I can see why not. But he he was he was such a such a good pilot, you know that, that, that I I wouldn't a momentary lapse. I wouldn't even yeah, but a momentary lapse, and that's what it was. Well, that's interesting. Well, um. Are you having a break? Dad, just uh, tell me, what's this a uh, picture of? This is your bomb? This, that's, the, that's the bomb group. That's the bomb group. And the bomber right behind it. And where are you in this picture? Uh, I can't tell you. I, 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 well, you can go. Go ahead. And let's see. Here it is. Here's the names on them. See, all, all here. Yeah, I can't read them, though. Why don't you just, like, point with a finger to you in that picture? All right. 
Uh, I'm taping this, so it'll... Yeah, I, I'm, this, I'm this person right there. Okay, I see the resemblance, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Very good. And uh, this is Piper. Piper's in here to the to the far left. That's uh, Harold Piper. Edwin Beckman. I know you don't have your... Um... Uh, here, here, this is me, and uh, <coughs> this is uh, Ashkin as a bombardier. He's the one that kept a good diary. Yeah. And that's, um, do you know which plane that is? I mean, I know oh, it's no, a B-24, but that's it's... That's just one we, we, we just landed in. Oh. And who took the picture? The, the base photographer. Do you remember his name? No. But no. he worked for the Army? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm putting this on pause. Um... You see, if you look at my list of combat missions, you can see <coughs> the, 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 the first two targets, mm -hmm. or the, uh, the first two missions, were in, on consecutive days. Oh, my. And, and that's an 11-hour mission, 11 hours in the air, uh, getting ready and getting debriefed and everything. It was about a 15-hour day. I don't know if that came out, but I'll scan that too. Yeah, that's a lot of pressure. Weren't you exhausted? Yeah, the the first see the first mission I didn't fly with my group. Mm -hmm. I flew with another pilot because his navigator was sick, mm -hmm. and so they they just picked me out of the hat and and I, I flew with them. And then the next day I get down, I find out I got to go back to G Munich, Germany again, <laughs> and it was one hell of a mission for me because it was my first one. <laughs> My goodness. See? And so so that was a, 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 at the end of the, see, that's July the 11th. 44. Yeah, and this is July the 12th. Oh, my. And this is July the 13th. Oh, no. So so we were. But then we, you got the 18th, 19th, and 20th after that. 18th, 19th, and 20th, another three days in a row. See, well, you had to fly it that way because that's the way the weather went. Mm -hmm. See, they wanted, if they at all possible, they wanted to get over Germany when, the, when it was uh, uh, C A V U, you know. C A V U. That's uh, uh, Ceiling Invisibility Unlimited. Oh, exactly. <laughs> well, it's it's a, it's a you know a common term in uh, in, in flying. Uh, in flying, yes. C -A -V -U. Not just a military term. No, and uh, yeah, it's a uh, both military and civilian. Uh, when somebody says. What are the conditions? You say C-A-V-U. That means uh, no clouds in the sky. So go. And, and <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. Um, the, um, yeah, the, the, there's a lot of these are, are, you can see that, well, see, they, they had, they had a, uh, a sort of a clear July. Yeah. So, so we did a lot of flying. And that was after D-Day, so you were yeah, uh, right really in. pushing on the Germans at that point, oh, right? Oh, yeah. Well, we, we were trying to destroy uh, what we what we went to, to a lot uh, uh, was uh, the, uh, the Hamm. At Hamm, Germany, there was a tremendous big uh, marshalling yards, like the one down in uh, uh, Alexandria, Virginia, mm -hmm. where, where you got 22 or 23 train tracks uh, running parallel and for about five miles. Wow. Well, the Germans had uh, about 1,400 Polish prisoners, and they had all worked on railroads. Oh. And we would drop bombs on the, at Ham uh, Railroad marshalling yards and just tear the hell out of it. I mean, because I mean, any bombardier can hit a marshalling yard. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> it would, all the tracks were torn up, any, anything moving on it was blown up. Mm. And, uh, and then we, uh, and then we would hear, we've got to go back to Ham again. The very next day? Oh, not the very next well, but day. Soon. About six weeks later, and, and we said, how in the world could we uh, have uh, 
anything going on in Ham after that last blast we saw. Mm -hmm. and, and it was pure and simple that they, they put all 1,400 of these uh, Polish prisoners to work on fixing it up. My goodness. And they were prisoners of war. And that was instantly in violation of the, of the Con Geneva Convention. Because you, you aren't supposed to work prisoners of war. Because that's kind of like slave labor, too. Uh, well, um, it was slave labor, really. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't prisoners of war. It was a mixture of prisoners of war and slave labor. Pretty despicable, anyway. Yeah. Okay, we're going to... We're running out of tape here, so... Okay. Bomb the railroad repair sheds at Karlsruhe, Germany. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 we were spent, sent, off, we sent frequently to, to bomb railroads because... That's the way they move the uh, ammunition and uh, equipment uh, through to France. Mm -hmm. And of course, this was uh, November of '44, but it was still it was still happening, you know. Yeah. So, so uh, at at this time, I, I don't have any particular stories of the rest of the, the missions, and none of them that were any more different than, it, than this, see. But uh, when it came time for us to go home, the Air Force decided that Piper and Beckman and his crew had done such a good job on the bombing that they would keep us over there flying free. Wow. So instead of being sent home, uh, Beckman and Piper and myself, we didn't need a bombardier, and uh, uh, then the radio operator and engineer uh, stayed and was sent up to uh, a, a supply base in northeast or northwest of, the, of Britain, and we, f we flew anything, we, we, we flew in a, D a DC-3 but of course, an army DC-3, which is stripped down and, and has uh, just uh, aluminum bucket seats along the, along each side of the plane, and the f cargo space was in in between the seats. Mm. So we would fly uh, personnel uh, who wanted to go to one particular base or another uh, for either that they had been on that base before and, and had been relieved or sent to England for uh, training and had to go back to the base or they were doctors that were visiting all the bases regularly at different at, on a different schedule mm -hmm. but whenever they had anything like that that's where we'd go that day and we flew to all over France uh, you know delivering a, a usually a, medicine and, and ammunition and uh, anything but heavy guns. We never, never had it bother with that. But uh, we, we would be given orders, well, fly to Brussels and there's a guy there who wants to go to uh, southern France for some reason. And in this case, it was, it was a, uh, a captain who was de detailed, as they say, uh, to uh, su supply the, uh, office the, London, the officers' club in London with uh, cognac, and so we flew. We flew down to, we flew over and picked him up in Brussels, and we flew him down to cognac, and he loaded 36 cases of cognac in this in this plane, and. Uh, then we uh, flew, flew him back up to London, and then we flew him back up to the, uh, the base in the Royal well, England. I forget what thing their base is now. I should have said. Was it seething? No, it wasn't seething. No, no. It, uh, uh, Why was I thinking of that one? I, Why was I thinking of that one? That's the one that the 448 bomb group is, was uh, uh, located. Uh, oh. All of our bombing missions ended up there. Oh, I see. All of them that weren't aborted. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, that was the uh, called uh, the Air Service Command. It was a s sort of a, 
uh, branch of the A, what was famous in the, in the World War II time was the ATC, uh, Air, the Air, Trans Air Transport Command, mm -hmm. ATC. But it is, this was just, uh, they call it an Air Service Command, but uh, we were nothing but freight flyers. But this was after you'd completed all your bombing. Yeah, stuff. right. Instead of being sent home, they sent everybody else home. Oh, but how'd you feel about that? You wanted I to go home? It. I liked it. You I, did? I, I the most things you were found I had in the service. Really? Yeah. I mean, you know, you get up every morning and, and you don't know where you're going, but you get to the. And they'd say, and all, all the time, I, I saw a lot of. I got into a lot of fields that I'd flown over and, and never landed there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I had a. A ball there, but oh, it, was, good. it was distracting. You know, you didn't, you didn't worry about anything. Mm -hmm. you know? And of course, of course, all you, you had to worry about the weather and, and things like that. And one time, the uh, the only error that I remember Piper making was he got too close to the hangar uh, when we landed at Le Bourget in Paris. And we had planned to go down to uh, downtown and ride the Eiffel Tower and everything. We had all, after he parked this plane here, because we, we didn't have any assignment and this was, we, we could pick the place we wanted to stay overnight. So we were going to stay overnight in Paris. Well, he, he bungled the right wing. Oh. Out at the wing tip, fortunately. Didn't, didn't bungle any cook. So, we had to, we had to uh, get a hold of the repair people on Le Bourget. The, the army had a, 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 a what do you call it, a, a, a detachment there, and so we got got a hold of them. And they said, "Well, it says we've got a we've got a plane over here in the, at the edge of the field. It's all busted up except the right wing." It says so. Uh, if you go over there and uh, take that right wing off, we will be taking this one. Off of this one, the wingtip, and it's not very heavy, I and mean, it's not exactly light, but you know, three men could carry it easy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, we went over to the to the uh, story stump and found the plane that they were talking about. We took the right wingtip off of it, and, and we got back, got it back to to uh, uh, the uh, up at the hangar. They, the mechanics put it on up there, put it on. And, uh, but by that time, it was too late to do anything. Oh, so you didn't get <laughs> to see Paris. I, we didn't get down to Paris at all. Uh. So, uh, uh, but uh, that, that was the kind of things that happened in that, in that sort of service, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and we, had a, we, we had a base that we went to uh, over uh, in the middle of France. Uh, it was near a little town. I can't think of the name of it now. But uh, they gave everybody a a billet wherever they could. The, the base didn't have anything. It was just a little grass field, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> so they gave me a a French couple to live with. And I took I went up to the to the door, knocked on, introduced myself, and they, oh yes, we heard you were coming and. And so they gave me an upstairs bedroom, and Piper and Beckman went to another place where they could take both of them. And the radio operator and, and his buddy went to another one. So, but we're all in this little town on the same, all on the same street, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. And then we, and there was an army uh, uh, kitchen for the people taking care of this uh, this air this uh, airport, and. Uh, a few other services around it, and of course, by this time, the war had pushed by, and this was this was this was behind the lines mm -hmm. in, in, uh, at that time. And uh, so we we uh, flew out of there uh, uh, every morning to wherever we had to go, and most of the time it was back to this place up in, in uh, England. And I'll have to look for that. Now how did those people in France? Were they? Um, how did they feel about having to take people in? Were they? Um, oh, they, they, they got paid for it. Oh, and they. Uh, yeah. How how were their 
how did their lives seem after the well, war? I mean, I well, mean, it, it, I see. I couldn't communicate with them. Oh. One thing I could say was Shoid Aqua or something like that. Like, <laughs> ask for uh, hot water. <laughs> okay. <laughs> for shaving, you know. Yeah. And uh, it, but it was uh, uh, they were nice people. Mm. And the, the the one of the incidents was that they had kept a German soldier when they were occupied by demand. Uh -huh. And uh, the uh, guy had left in a hurry and he left a whole bunch of those uh, uh, Nazi eagles. Oh, really? That he was going to sew onto his uniform, I guess, change them or something. And so I grabbed him up and put him in my souvenir bag. <laughs> oh, did you get many souvenirs like that? Because well, you were up in the air most of the time. Yeah, most of the time. Yeah. You, you know, we weren't... I, I just happened to have the opportunity. Yeah. So uh, uh, the, the, I asked the French lady if she, in my pigeon French uh, if she wanted them. She said, get them out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame her. <laughs> Interesting. So uh, Now, during this time, did you keep in touch with, like, your father and well, uh, yeah, your I, brothers and sisters? Yeah, I, I, I wrote my father, uh, I guess... Uh, once a month, mm -hmm. uh, which you know, was, and I was very busy. I mean, it, it sounds like, and and a lot of times when I got home from flying, uh, I was tired. Mm -hmm. See, and, and 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 you know, when you have three or four days running like like these missions did have, it, it really tired you out. And and uh, from what I understand from looking at Ashkenaz's uh, diary, that some of the missions were like nine, ten hours, and then oh, a lot of work. You know, it's not like a regular day of work where you go, know, oh, gotta go, it's coffee break time. Well, see, what, what we had was we'd take off with a 48, 48 plane uh, off, of, off of the seething air base, see, wow. and we get up over a, a, uh, a tower out on the, on the coast, mm -hmm. see, and up there swarming around in those clouds are about 16 or, th or 18 groups of 48. Mm-hmm. And we make a, a, a 500 plane raid or a 750 plane raid. Wow. You know, by flying away from that. Now, of course, there's other other towers down the coast where other groups or groups are are, are are marshalling up too. And we all came together right at the French coast or the uh, Holland coast or. That wherever. must have been a sight to see. Oh, it was. You look back and. It's it's comforting too. <laughs> well, <laughs> all these guys up there, they, they go going to hit somebody else. <laughs> wow. But, but anyway, it, it, uh, the the whole time was, to me, uh, a big adventure. Of course, I mean, every time I I got down, I celebrated the fact that that it was it, you know I landed safely. And, and what did you do to celebrate? Well. Uh, Sit around, and have a cigarette with them, and think about tomorrow's tomorrow's raid. <laughs> mm -hmm. Did um, did you have some of the people there who I don't know? Did they celebrate too hard or? or no, they... our, our crew was very sober. Oh really? Yeah, uh, there were crews that that uh, uh, alcohol was a problem. Really? As even to the point where they had to break them up and and re reassign them all. Mm -hmm. But uh, but it didn't happen too often, you know. It didn't. But you'd hear about it, mm -hmm. and of course the, the army uh, always tried to to uh, not distract people who were doing a good job by telling them all the bad news. Oh, you think so? Well, sure. It yeah. was it was a mind game because you have to be thinking about what you're doing and not reflecting on about what somebody else done it. You know, mm -hmm. might have been a screw up or whatever. They just didn't report it to anybody. Well, that probably would make sense. It did make sense, yeah. Because it, it, the less you, the less you heard about what happened to somebody else, uh, the fewer things you had to worry about. Right. Because right away you'd start thinking, "Well, what if that happened to me?" Mm -hmm. You know, and, mm -hmm. and and that's not too smart. Right. So interesting. It, I mean, while the army wasn't the best thing in the world I've ever dealt with. Uh, I, I did have to admire the organization and the, the uh, thinking 
that went behind running the air base. Mm -hmm. And we had, we had a very good guy. I, I liked him. What, your commanding officer? Yeah. And, and, Do you remember uh, his name? Yeah. As a matter of fact, when I finished my 35 missions, they had a, uh, uh, a new system that came out, a, a radar that they referred to it as Mickey. And it was uh, especially, uh, you know, for the navigator. And uh, he learned how, he went to school, he learned how to read those green blotches. It, that, was a, that was all the definition that you would get. And he could uh, look at, a, uh, look at a, a, like it looked like uh, somebody spilled ink all over the, green ink all over the photograph. Mm -hmm. and, and they would flash him up on a, on a, on a screen and the navigator would put down a Dusseldorf or uh, Cologne or some other German target. And then they would grade them. And the guys that could identify every one of them were top men. And I never went through that training, but the, uh, the captain that was uh, interviewing me and trying to sort out what we were, where we got, you know, what, what we could do he said, we will break you off here at your 30th mission and send you to the school to become a Mickey man. And uh, I said, and I said, now how many missions do I have to fly? He said, oh, he says, you'll have to fly about 20 more. <laughs> and I said, he said, of course, it's volunteer. He said, you, and he said, you, and he said, after you fly 10 missions as a Mickey man, they will give you your captaincy. And I was a first lieutenant, and of course that looked, looked very attractive, but it, did, it didn't attract me enough. <laughs> because I'd, I'd seen too many close calls. Right. The, and, and just one slip, a couple feet, and, and you'd be in curtains. So mm -hmm. I, anyway, I, I, I turned it down. Mm -hmm. Because I, I had already decided that I wanted to go back and be an engineer. You weren't going to be in the military for a I, I, I wasn't attracted to the military, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Wartime was exciting and, and a lot of times fun, but uh, but the military life didn't appeal to me. It was too regimented. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I told the guy that was that was uh, uh, mustering me out of the service the same thing. He gave me the same question. He said, "Will you sign up for two more years? We will be sure that you are put into a training system that will result in your being uh, a captain, mm -hmm. See? and you'll go back into to uh, you know the command system and, and uh, go, go what to, what was then ATC and." Uh, I had already gone through this. He didn't know it, but uh, about three months before, when, when we first got when we first got back to, to the United States, well, they sent me to St. Joe, Missouri, to a, a uh, command school for, or not a command school, but a flight school that, uh, especially to to test your proficiency in navigation, and uh, it, it, I remember. The, it was on that base that I heard that the war in Asia was over. It was in mm -hmm. August, August the um, 14th or 13th, something like that, 15th maybe. Mm -hmm. And uh, right. we had just come down from a flight from uh, St. Joe, Missouri, out across to Denver, up in the mountains. And we had gone through one of the wildest storms that I've ever been through. <laughs> that little B7, uh, 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 C-47 with its 10 navigators on them. One of them, one of them could navigate because the plane wasn't wasn't steady for one second. You couldn't read your instruments. Oh, it was going up 50 feet in the air updraft and <laughs> drops oh. right, it, right after it gets up the and it was over the mountains and, and, and a windstorm like I'd never ever been in. Wow. And, and this is just in training. <laughs> they almost scared me more they didn't combat. Oh, my. <laughs> but anyway, we got out of it, of course, like everything else. 
we flew out of it, we flew out into mild weather, and then we landed, and all you could have was just the memory. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> it was just something on a meteorolo meteor meteorological charts that they didn't look at before they sent us. Wow. But, uh, and this was just before you left the service? Well, yeah, because, uh, well, I, I that was August 15th, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I still was in the in the system to be uh, in ATC. Wow. So they sent me uh, from from uh, St. Joe, Missouri down to Miami and I was supposed to start a, uh, a train in the Florida area uh, to finally be appointed to an ATC unit that was flying from Miami to Karachi, India. Well, we call it India now. I think they call it the Karachi. The, is that Pakistan there? Uh, Pakistan, yeah, I think. Uh, I think it is. But we, it was, it, Karachi, was, we always call it Karachi, India anyway. Right. So anyway, uh, I, I was down there in Miami waiting for uh, the uh, army to make up its mind. Or the Air Force, they call finally came, they came to call. But uh, I had one uh, very interesting uh, story to tell you about the the uh, war part. I was going, I went into a nightclub with, with another guy, and uh, we got a table. And I said I got to go to the bathroom. So on the way down to the bathroom, we we, we uh, I ran across this guy with his rump sticking away out at the bar. You know, he's sitting on a bar stool, mm -hmm. and I ran into it. <laughs> and I said, I looked at him. And I said, Hey! And he was the guy that was the bombardier on the the plane uh, on uh, that was in the in the barracks right next to me and seething. Oh yeah, and where where were you in Miami at the yeah, time? Yeah, uh -huh. and and this oh, was wow. post war. He still had his uniform on because he wasn't he wasn't out of out of service yet. Well, of course, I wasn't either. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, I forget his name. I, I forget names terribly now. But um, he was. It, it, we just you know hugged one another. We hadn't seen each other for so long, and and we had been through a lot you know together and everything and. And uh, I saw him get shot down over uh, Bremen. Oh dear! And uh, you know, I saw him ch come out of the nose wheel because he, he was a bombardier, and the navigator had already gone out. And then he came out, and uh, they were dropped. There. They were abandoning ship because so they had the parachutes and everything. Oh yeah, parachutes yeah. on. Well, yeah, you always flew with your parachute buckled up and... Well, I guess so. <laughs> see, and ready to go. And, and the bombardiers and the navigators had to get out the, the uh, nose wheel. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, uh, to go down through that tunnel that underneath the pilot and, and go out to, go out to bo Bombay. The, the Bombay had to be open, see, and a lot of times the, the Bombay doors would get jammed and, and you get in that damn little tunnel, you could never get out. Mm -hmm. But we... The pilot would always let the nose wheel down when he got in trouble because that, that allowed the, the uh, bombardier and pilots, or bombardiers and navigators and, and the nose gunner to get out of, uh, of a, uh, you know, a, a plane that was damaged. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, uh, I saw him because we were flying well, like from here to across the street. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I recognized him very easy. And he uh, he went right down into the smoke of this burning oil tank. Mm. And he said that he drifted off away from the fire and landed on a German street. And they captured him. And uh, in violation of the of the uh, ne Geneva Convention, they didn't take him to a prisoner of war camp. They marched him through Czechoslovakia or whatever the next country was. You know, on a long, long hike. It was like 400 miles. Oh, my. And they just fed them. And I, I think they were going to try to put
push them up so that they'd be picked up by the Russians coming in on the Germans from the East Front. Mm. There was some kind of an idea in their mind that they took all these guys that, that came down and instead of putting them in a prisoner of war camp, they, they marched them for about 400 miles. Right, he, said, he said, I had the equivalent of a ham sandwich for three days. Uh, that, that's all they gave me was one ham sandwich, and he said it wasn't, didn't even taste good. But he said I just ate it because it, it was the only only relish, you know, uh, food he'd had, ever had. But we had a long talk anyway in this in this bar. Well, that, was that the first time you'd seen him since you, you oh, saw yeah. him I, I, dropping out of that pl plane? I, oh yeah, I, I never. You, did you know whether he was even I alive? Thought, no, I didn't. I, th I thought for sure he was dead. I mean, he was going right down into a fire oh, my. in a parachute. My goodness. But fortunately, there was a side wind or something that carried him away from the fire, and he landed on a German street. Hmm. He said, of course, I didn't land, but what, they had three rifles in my face. Oh, dear. So, uh, yeah, nothing to do. That's amazing. It's amazing you ran into him so oh, far yeah. from there. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, 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 for a week or so, I, I, I thought about him, you know, about uh, nothing that, that what he had gone through, I mean. He said he said he had lost. I think he was 160 pounds, and he, uh, he, he you know got down to maybe 112 mm -hmm. just because they starved him. That's and and of course, see that's one of the things about the Geneva Convention is that uh, all parts of the Nazi regime were in favor of, it. and if you got uh, caught by that particular clique, you know. You could get, you could just get a hell of a time, mm. and that's what he got. That's too bad. But uh, they, they told, they told him that you're going to, we're marching you to Poland, and as you, as if, if you can't do anything else, we're going to turn you over to the slave, slave labor battalions. But uh, he said, fortunately, uh, it, it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. He said we worried about it, the ones that were caught. I'm sure they did. But, uh, said, but they did. He said uh, it didn't happen. Yeah. But they walked. They walked almost 400 miles. That's amazing. Yeah, it is. It, 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 you know, take a 160 pound man, wear him down to, to 120. I'm surprised he kept that much weight on him, considering yeah. his ordeal. Yeah. Well, he must have been a strong person. Yeah. Well, I can't even remember his name now, but uh, but he's a nice looking blonde guy, about same age I was, you know, 23, 24. Mm-hmm by that time. Yeah. Well, um, I I think this might be a good time to stop the tape. In that particular field, uh, section of, of, and of course the war was uh, over on May the 7th of 1945. And uh, <coughs> so, uh, so you mean the European part of the it? European part, of right? It. Okay, okay. And of course, it was it was in August of '45 when the Japanese surrendered. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, we, they they sent sent me uh, from that kind of life to uh, a what they call a uh, it had it had a fancy name, but it was a departure from the service. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I went up to, I was sent up to a, a, uh, a field uh, near Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, we stayed there uh, about a month waiting for orders. And then and, and, and finally the orders came uh, in uh, September of uh, 45. And we went up to uh, Camp Atterbury in Indiana, which is close to my home, and uh, maybe 50 miles. And uh, so that's where I was, uh, uh, what they call it, uh, discharged. So um, now I understand you have done quite a bit of your studies in Purdue, studying engineering, but I know that you finished your engineering degree at Cascade University in Washington, D.C. So how did that transpire after the war? Well, uh, <coughs> uh, I had some friends in, in uh, 
Washington D.C. the Perkinses. Well, they used to live across from from us, across the alley from us. In in the other Washington. In in, in Washington, Indiana. Right. And uh, so uh, I decided that I wanted to investigate the living in Washington. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a a fella in my neighborhood, uh, Albert Pett. Mm -hmm. P-E-T-T -T. and uh, he wanted to go along with me because he was also going to look at the, uh, the universities in, in uh, Boston and, and I wanted to see also see Boston College and uh, so I said well I, said, I haven't got any money so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hitchhike to Boston and so he, he said well all right, I'll hitchhike. And every night we, when we got tired, we stopped at a hotel, you know. And uh, and he was, I, I had to nurse my money because I knew we were going to be on the road about three or four days. And uh, so uh, I should have known better because the guy wasn't too bright, but but I had sort of a sympathy for him because he was a nice guy. Mm -hmm. Well, he went. We went up to Boston, and, and uh, he went out to Holy Cross to talk to them. The Holy Cross College. Yeah, or? Holy Cross College. That's the uh, that's a liberal arts. Mm -hmm. See, and I, I went over to Boston College. They had an engineering uh, subjects and things like that. But it turned out that they didn't have any mechanical engineering department. Mm -hmm. And I, I had spent a year and a half at Purdue, and I wasn't going to start in a, in a chemical engineering uh, outfit, and that's, that's all they had. And physics, which is not an engineering field, but a general scientific field. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, uh, Boston is a, is a waste of time. Uh, Pet had already decided that he's going back home. He got homesick. Oh, but back home to Washington, Indiana? Yeah. Oh. So then I'm up in Boston by myself. So um, I uh, went out to the train station and negotiated a ticket on the train to Washington. But I didn't want to fool around trying to hitchhike and get down there two or three weeks and be uh, fagged out, couldn't do anything anyway. Mm -hmm. So I got myself a, a, a train ticket and got off of the, the train in Washington, D.C. And I went out to... Uh, the area where my friends Perkins lived and I got myself a room mm -hmm. and uh, so then I went to see them the next morning and, and uh, you know talked over my plans and they're the ones who suggested that I go to Catholic U. Mm -hmm. they, I hadn't had it in mind as a matter of fact I'd never heard of Catholic U mm -hmm. when I got to Washington and they were the one that told me about it and so I went out and uh, it was a nice looking place and, and uh, uh, I liked it and so I didn't check out the mechanical department. <laughs> I should have. Well, why? What happened? It was a disaster. Yeah, uh, because you ended up, you have a degree in electrical engineering. Yeah, that's right, because I switched from mechanical to <laughs> electrical because of the chaos in the mechanical department. I see. And I won't go through the, some of the distracting and uh, on uh, polite words you use. <laughs> well, I'm just I'm also interested because now, do you think that being in the service changed your life in terms of your career decisions and where you ended up living? I mean, because you didn't go back to Washington, and did you think about what life would be like if you had stayed in Washington, Indiana, as opposed to making the move out to the East Coast? Well, I I, I was very uh, 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 very. Uh, skeptical about whether I'd ever be able to make any kind of money at all in, in Washington, Indiana. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I worked for as little as 15 cents an hour really? in Washington, Indiana, and I don't know where it ever got any better or not. <laughs> but, uh, but that was, of course, pre-war. Uh, as a matter of fact, I worked for even less than that because I, I had a job where I, I went to work at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and I got off at uh, uh, when the morning crew came in at six, hmm. and I worked all night long, 
when I had no customers, I cleaned the uh, the restaurant. Oh my! See, and uh, at the end of the day, or at the end of your period of work, the uh, boss would take out uh, his wad and he would peel off two one dollar bills, and that was your payment for that day. He didn't take yeah. out any Social Security. He didn't even tell the Social Security that he was hiring people. Dear. And I mean, he, he worked entirely out of the wad in his pocket. And uh, he didn't keep receipts. He didn't give you one or you didn't give him one or anything. So this was before you went to the war? No, this is after. Oh, oh you, you did go back to Washington, Indiana yes. for a little while? Yeah. And I, I just, you know, yeah, this is the best. If this is the best I can do here, I'm getting out. Right. So I went to. You went to the East Coast. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I don't care what's up there, in a way of troubles or everything. It's not any better than this, right. <laughs> or any worse than this. So it was just uh, to me a, 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 a blank town. And did you use the GI Bill to go to to school? Yeah. And yeah. did that give you some freedom in the choice of school that you went oh, to? Oh yeah, you could go anywhere you wanted to. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, so, uh, on the recommendation of the Perkinses, oh, I went to Catholic U. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, got, I got there sometime, uh, I guess by that time it was... Okay, that yeah, helicopter's moving. Yeah, that was 1946, and uh, so uh, I... Uh, went into the dormitory and, you know, lived like any student does. Mm -hmm. And uh, so after a while I decided I need some, some money in the cash. In the, so so I went to work in the library. Mm, That's how did. I met your mother. Oh, I didn't realize you worked there too. I thought oh, yeah. you yeah. studied there and she worked there, but you both worked there. Well, I didn't work there very long. Uh, or at least I didn't work all the time, mm -hmm. as, as long as she was before, before. By the time that she had, uh, uh, that we had gotten married, I, I had picked up a little better job. Mm -hmm. But I worked for the Army Corps of Engineers for a while. Oh. And uh, so. Uh, How was that like working for the Army but not being, you know. Oh, I was civilian. It was, it was a whole different game, huh? Oh, it's, yeah, entirely. But, but it had some. Some of the military uh, aspects that, that it was, we were really a uh, civilian uh, government agency. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see what else. You know, maybe this would be a good place. If we, can you explain about how recently you've gotten back in touch with um, people in your bombing group and how? How did that happen? Who contacted who first? Well, the bombardier was was the most active in trying to find everybody. Mm -hmm. and that was Ashkenaz. Yeah, and he uh, and he found uh, uh, Percicello, who was the radio operator, and uh, Gilbert Morris, who was a waste gunner, and uh, and he found me. Mm -hmm. And uh, the the rest of them. Uh, Albert Schletter, who was a nose gunner, uh, he, he didn't want to be contacted by any of his previous acquaintances of the service. Now, was there anything in what happened while you knew him that would lead you to believe it was a, more unpleasant for him? Or no, do you no, ever? I, well, uh, what he was, he was, he was a very, uh, uh, what do you say, unjolly person. Mm. He didn't he didn't rub off on anybody else, you know, I mean, he didn't try to sell in, but he was, he was glum. Oh. See? And he always had one worry when we were flying. He was a nose guy, and he was too big for the, for the, for really, for the nose uh, gunner's uh, operating area. And uh, he was constantly afraid that we were going to get uh, uh, disabled, and he asked to get, we got to get out of the ship. And he said, somebody, and he's so big that he couldn't reach back there and unhook the latch for his door. Oh. Somebody had to do it for him. Mm. And I said, Al, don't worry about it. I won't go out of this airplane unless you're standing here in front of me. Because I'll help you out of the damn 
uh, gun thing. And well, he he'd bring it up every trip. Really? Just don't forget now. <laughs> <laughs> he was hard to convince, huh? Yeah, but he was very, he was very unjolly. I, I I don't know. Uh, he probably was a nice guy as a civilian, maybe, or among his own people. Mm -hmm. But they 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 all spoke German from someplace up in the northeast. Uh, you know. Uh, um, uh, I don't know exactly. I see. But uh, Perky Perkicello was uh, uh, jolly, and mm -hmm. friendly, and everything like that. So when he, when uh, Ashkenaz told me that he had found Perkicello up in, in uh, Cold Spring, New York, and he gave me the address, I wrote Perky a letter. Mm -hmm. and I got a letter from him. And and we've 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 swapped two or three letters. That's nice. So, so it's a. I, I really really like Perky. I always do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, another one that I liked was a very quiet guy. Was uh, Arthur Decker. He was the engineer. He was the one that took care of the uh, level of the uh, fuel in the planes and transferred it from one tank to another if the mm -hmm. plane was getting out of balance or something like that. Uh, he also took care of. Uh, you know, in whatever was engineering on the, in a sense of mechanical, mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, uh, Piper liked him, and, and, and it was, he was hard not to like, but because because he never, uh, he never came on uh, uh, in any in any kind of a conversation. He wouldn't give an opinion even if you asked him. <laughs> you know, that's that, that's a, a personality quirk. But I, I like him. He, he never, whenever we were talking about something that was non-related uh, to the war or anything like, he sort of fizzed off. I mean, this. And where is he now? He died. Oh. I just found out this month he died. He did. He died recently. Yeah, very recently. Oh. Uh, per Perky and, and uh, Ashkin has both knew about it. And when I called Gilbert Morris, uh, in uh, I called him one day. And, and his wife told me he was very, very sick. He was at home, and he uh, uh, which, uh, he, he had that AML. Mm -hmm. The leukemia? Yeah. And, uh, it, it, and so they they had to keep a, a bottle of blood connected to him all the time to keep him alive. Oh, that's a shame. And uh, uh, he was, uh, then I called up. Uh, his place in uh, Stillwater, Oklahoma, and the phone. Nobody answered the phone for a long time, and then, and then, finally, um, uh, his wife got back to me and said that he was in uh, St. Joseph Hospital in Tulsa, mm. and so I got that phone number and I called St. Joseph Hospital in Tulsa, and he he was in a coma. Oh. That doesn't sound good. Uh, so, but then uh, I called up about two or three days later, and he'd come out of the coma. Hmm. And his voice was pretty strong, you know. Oh, so it, it was uh, it was sort of like a, a, a transformation. So I think the hospital must have, you know, did something to, uh, uh, you know, affect his his at least his uh, vital signs that particular day. But uh, his wife was uh, was very pessimistic. She said, "I I, I don't have much hope." That's too bad. But uh, but I, but then I, I haven't I haven't called her back again. Hmm. You know that's. So, I just want to make sure I remember this. Is there anything that we didn't talk about that you were hoping to get? Um, can you think? We covered a lot. Yeah. I know. I, I I think we pretty much covered it. It's a. Uh, well, um, we could stop here, and um, if later in my visit you come up with something, or you want to make sure to, yeah, we can we could do another session. This is a good place to stop. Yeah, so I think okay. I'll put it on pause. And before I forget, I wanted to mention um, that I didn't at the beginning of the tape that we're in Naples, Florida, and we're at the Imperial Wilderness. Condo Association. Condo Association, and that's at uh, 14100 East Tamiami Trail in a little south of Naples. Right. Okay?